happened. Work on it. Yeah. 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 It's about the same as it was. Yeah. It's the same as it was. Which one are you going to talk? Can we do this song? Same thing. Okay. Oh, I'm okay. Let's play this one. Let's give it time to set up. That's before the lesson. Really? Why is that? You just don't like it? I guess. Huh. Okay. <laughs> you said it still costs the same? Yeah, well, this is also true. I wouldn't. Here's the thing. 
few more weeks and he will be back to coughing in your face yeah. again. And I don't mean that in a callous kind of What's happening is people, especially like around here, you, you don't have a densely populated area, so people can't actually practice it. It's like, you know, you go to, you know, it's not like an apartment complex. You can go to city where people are kind of like bothering the house to get everybody in the house. We're not going to have the same. Well, you, you keep saying that it's going to be a Well, it will, to, it will to a degree in that I don't think that. I think that when I say it will, I mean, I think organization will get some of the shift. Like, a lot of people, first thing they want to do when they get out of college is run to Chicago, New York. And they flee Dover. They flee, you know, even someplace like Annapolis, Maryland. It's okay, but a lot of people they run to DC, run to Baltimore, they run to these big cities. Well, what's going to happen is people are starting to figure out there's a world out there. It's super expensive to live here. And, you know, all it takes is one global pandemic. This is true. Did you see the end of the beach is like that before? So and then the, immediately everybody were happy. Are there any more than that? Yeah. Yeah. We have a very short term window of time. But what I'm saying, I guess what I'm saying is, and I agree with you on that. The only thing I'm saying is I think that I'm not saying, you know, ten people at church is gonna be the new normal. Yeah. But I'm saying that I think that there are going to be some lasting impacts that um, come from this that are not, that we're not going to go back to, you know. There's going to be some people who are going to be like, you know what? I'm not a hero if I don't show up to church because I got a, a step home. So I'm going to stay home and be okay with it. And not only do they and their community be okay with it, but there's a lot of church leaders who are going to be comfortable with the idea that, you know what? Because, I mean, I've been live streaming for a long time. There's a lot of people that are like, what do you mean? They're not going to do it. And it's like, why not? You know? These are his people. And they don't have any business at all. I had that thing set up. Were you able to hear it and see it though? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to actually put a document up tomorrow. I won't be able to get to it today, I'm afraid, but I'm going to put a document up tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah basically, I thought I did a few weeks ago, but I something happened. I, I'm serious. I put a whole PDF together. I'm going to go find it again and post it again in multiple places, send it out as email because, um, you know, it was kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Well, you have to go back to the book club. No. Oh. Oh. Well, we have two chapter uh, three more talk to each other. And she was a good teacher who asked me last night to talk to her even more. Okay. So, let me change this token that she's doing tab. <laughs> I think maybe she's talking about the screen. Oh, yeah, she did it more. Well, the thing about it is, there's only, yeah, no. there's only so much I can do about that. We're, we were actually waiting, we were actually doing our last time to put your um, camera, like, to one from 
like hired up so that we didn't have to worry about it. And we decided it probably be better to win. We were literally in the way to do this. Which is probably the great thing to do. With, you know, less people thinking in here. We don't want to learn too much. You know, people think it's like, I think about some people stress or struggle with that a little bit. So, we'll um, wait and see kind of what the, it's not expensive, but we all learn this thing. Yeah, I've got I've got eight cards in that. Eight or nine. Really? Yeah, that's so they're still banking? No. I just yeah, basically. And so they're basically they don't they told them when all this is over. Um we may or may not we'll see what happens. Yeah. So these were Oh, wow. Come on. I said, that's taking a little far. <laughs> I was going to say, if I had known, I'd have to pick up some stuff. I, I've been waiting. I've really been waiting to go. And I said, I was going to ask for your record, but I don't want to go because my parents, they're healthy. They get a you know, shelter in place and everything, but I don't want to take any chances. Kids, even though they're in the house, they can do anything. I don't want to take any chances. Just a remote possibility. Exactly. They turn over the deal, they're probably going to take it. They're going to run away. So, what they just cut out? And the unfortunate part is, and we love it, probably won't hear this from the other folks, but there's a lot of people who do not appreciate the fact that this is why so many people are in, you know, a haste to start back with the economy going. It's not, I don't care about public safety, it's just, I, you know, there's only so much food. Um, there's only so much you can get at a given. Um, you know, $1,200 or whatever. That can only carry you so far. And then, not only that, I was slightly interested, I probably just discussed, I was talking to my son yesterday, explaining to him, he has friends who takes his classes online, you know, math and whatever and stuff like that. But I was explaining to him, because he's like, I don't understand why everybody's, you know, so, like, they won't let the kids take the CD because the kids don't carry it. Very unlikely to get the bags and come back. So they carry back the option if they're locked up. But I was pointing out to them, I said, I know you don't have to carry so much money, you don't have to use so many cards or whatever. But some of your friends, I told them, I said, well, maybe I don't know, I don't know why. But some kids, they're struggling with me because they ate breakfast and dinner and they didn't have to carry it. And now, you know, they're, they're not going to post that on the online or anything about it, but it really is hard. That fire, or like you said, may or may not touch that. That puts a lot of pressure. Yeah, plus, they got to have it all. And so, what's happening is rather than just writing that check for the government, there needs to be not that you can do anything to like pull out of that account, there needs to be contingency plans put in place where if something two years down, three years down, something like this happens again, how do you go about? Moving forward without having a shift in, in that. Because it doesn't matter who you vote for. It doesn't matter who you vote for. When coronavirus number 24 comes along and it sweeps down through the West Coast, it's just like, you know, what are we doing? You know, this is not a part of the plan. Anyway, let's just go ahead and uh, get started.
Things may be going on. Turn the TV off. Turn the TV off. Even if it's on mute. 
We don't want anything to take away from this time that we are still giving to God. Uh, just a quick reminder also for anybody, because uh, I've got a few text messages about the camera angle or the sound. Uh, just keep in mind, and I'm not saying it's your fault, but just keep in mind that some of that could be your device. Some of it could be your phone or your tablet or your computer, and it could be the angle in which you have, if you have a tablet and you're sitting up or if you're watching it on something that is not as wide. Just keep in mind that uh, we're doing our best. Try to adjust your settings first. Um, we have multiple devices. I'm actually looking at a couple of them now, so I'm making sure and I know that the broadcast is coming in clearly, but uh, do your best. We're doing our best. Please bear with us. And if you have any problems or any concerns, maybe it's not coming in clearly, uh, this is recorded, so you can always go back and watch it again later uh, if you can't uh, get the fullness of it live right now. Before we continue in our worship, I ask you to please uh, pray with me. Please bow. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for this day. Thank you for loving us and bringing us yet another opportunity for us to be able to worship you, to sing your praises, to come together. Even if we can't come together all at once in person, God, we know that we are one in the spirit, that because of your son and his sacrifice, because of what he did for us on the cross, because of the Holy Spirit that we have in us as those who are believers, who have faith in you, who have given our lives to you, that because of that spirit, we are all connected. We know that your love for us cannot be stopped. It cannot be blunted or, or pushed away or somehow muted because we are distant. And we thank you so much for that. We thank you so much for the hope that we have in you. We thank you so much for your love, your mercy, your forgiveness. Please be with us during this time. Allow everything that we offer to you today through our giving, allow everything that we offer to you through our songs and praise, allow our attention, allow everything that we present to you this time to be something that honors you, that makes you proud, and something that is worthy of us being your children. We know that there's never enough that we can do to ever earn your love and your forgiveness. But we are thankful that you still give us the ability to call you Father, and you still love us and call us your son and daughter. As we continue to move forward, God, be with us, be with me, be with everyone who's participating online. Allow, us, allow your spirit to move in such a way that we're able to grow, that we're able to be challenged and convicted, that our hearts can be moved closer and closer to you so that we can live and lead examples of Christ's love to the rest of the world. So your son's name we pray. Amen. We will continue, and before we take time to recognize what Jesus did for us on the cross by giving of his life, we're going to sing song number 645, The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, 
so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown in that old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. And exchange it someday for a crown to that old rugged cross. I will never be true. It shall every post gladly. Call me someday to my home far away where it's glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old running Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a
the bread and drink of the cup, you will show the Lord's death till he comes. Whoever, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Please be proud of the Lord. We will we are here because your son gave an all his time to us. We pray that we should not forget that we take this into our hearts. We pray that we take this bread as a man of food and food. We pray this through your son. Dear Lord, we are here to remember the sin, cleansing blood of your son. Lord, we pray that we take this blood and hand of food and food. We pray this through your son. The Lord's Supper, uh, and now is the appropriate time to pass our feet on the mouth. Uh, do not share the body until he is in the end. On my own. Please be proud of Dear Lord, we are, we are so blessed to be your children, Lord. We pray that through our open and loving hearts, we can give back a portion of your blessing so that we can return to your message and your glory and your love. We pray this to your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And now we have an announcement. Um, the bulletin, if you haven't gotten an email already, it will be posted shortly after we conclude here on the website. All you have to do is go into the event section and you can click on the bulletin. There'll be a PDF there. You open it up and you can read through it. We really appreciate Jenny uh, always making sure that people are updated. I saw her sneak up and maybe drive by and drop some. We appreciate you guys for keeping us up to date on things. Um, uh, some of these are, are the same as they have been for the past few weeks. Just make sure that they, if you are interested, you keep up to date with the different services that are being made available for those who are uh, having a difficult time with um, you know, having enough food and other resources. There are many things in the bulletin and the announcements that you can see over there that are statewide. There's also a coronavirus hotline that has recently been put in there. Um, remember, voting will still continue. Uh, absentee ballots and uh, those types of things can be found at the um, elections uh, portion of the Delaware.org website. So check that out. 
Uh, we will continue to stream on Wednesday nights. Uh, also, uh, we're going to start back up with our Sunday school. Uh, so Andrew's going to continue the lessons which he had begun. And we're going to be doing that online as well. Um, and with that, just a quick announcement as it was brought to my attention. Uh, there were, um, well, at least I thought, there were instructions that were put on the website on how to log in and how to participate. Uh, apparently, I thought I put those up there and I did not. So tomorrow they will be up there. Uh, when you go, again, you go to the website and you click on events, you will also be able to see a link that will provide instructions on how to log in, not only on Sundays, but also on Wednesday nights for our uh, Bible discussion and uh, allow us to be able to participate as well. Steve uh, got on me, so we will go this week. And I will make sure to be prepared so that everybody can participate after we are done going through the scriptures. We can go into our breakout um, rooms and be able to discuss it with one another. Give us some connections there. Uh, just a couple of other things. Uh, not only the, uh, like Andrew said, about the weekly giving to member. Um, and we understand that everybody can't, maybe some of us can't give as much, some of us frankly even give more, but let's not forget that um, the giving matters. Um, and so make sure that you go online to the um, secure, encrypted uh, giving portion of the website and give as much as you can. Um, a few other things, we have a couple of birthdays coming up. Um, Yes, so that means that, uh, first of all, how many of these? I forgot, I had a birthday this actually. Yeah, it was last Sunday. I didn't forget the anniversary, I just forgot to announce it. And the day kind of went on by. People were like, <laughs> so a week later. But uh, George Chandler and Natasha Astor both have birthdays coming up uh, on Tuesday. So please give George and Natasha a call or a text or something for their birthday on Tuesday. Uh, also, Dale Knight is coming up on the 26th. Continue prayer for Angela and her family and her health, the Leonard family as his sister is back in the hospital. Uh, she has actually, uh, says, contracted the uh, COVID-19 virus that's going around. So we pray for them as his sister. Also, uh, Jimmy and Tony and asked that you pray for their neighbor, Monica, as she's experiencing some health issues, and also her husband, who is experiencing some health issues as well. So, I guess those announcements, the rest of it you can find in here. Be, uh, just continue to pray for those being affected by the virus, those who are uh, dealing with issues, those who are still traveling, and some of us who are still working. Uh, we want to keep them in prayers also. So, let's continue. Then the song before Bill's lesson will be number 732. 732, praise the Lord God. We praise the Lord God for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is down on earth. Hallelujah, by the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Spirit of God, who has shown us our Savior, and scattered on high. Hallelujah, my 
subject that we had started on some time ago, and looking at Paul's letters that he wrote while he was in prison. I thought it was very appropriate that we do this, especially considering how many of us kind of feel a little bit restrained and captive in our own homes. We're not able to roam freely and do what we want to do. And so looking at these restrictions that Paul had, the thing about it was, Paul did not limit himself or mope or sit around and feel defeated. But, you know, he took the attitude that even though he was captive, even though he was in chains, even though he was bound and not free to visit the churches and visit the brothers and the sisters and instruct them, it did not stop him. It did not limit him in the sense that he did not allow it to be something that kept him from being able to do what it was that the Spirit had intended for him to do and carry out. And so I want us to look at one of those letters. It's actually a very, uh, even though they're called books, it's actually just a letter, and it's very small. Um, the book is Philemon. It's only, you know, a few verses. And I want to look at this because even though it's very small, it speaks to something very important for all of us to really remember, especially at this time when we can feel so limited in what it is that we're able to do. Limited feeling that, you know, the, the normal things that I would have done or, or the things I'd like to do or carry out in my ministry, in my regular daily life, I'm restrained, but are we really as restrained as we think we are? Or have we limited God's power and what he can do through us, even at a time when we're not, you know, as accessible, even at a time when we're not able to be directly in front of one another? And so I want to look at this. The title I've given the lesson today is Neighborhood Watch. Neighborhood Watch. Now, I remember growing up, this started back like in the 80s. Uh, I didn't live in a particularly bad neighborhood, but I remember when I was in elementary school, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I started seeing this guy come up, this picture. This is the picture. And you start, and it, I remember when they started the Neighborhood Watch program, where I'm from out in Cincinnati. I grew up in a place called Four Cars. You started seeing them everywhere. 
And it really was sparked by just a couple of little incidents, a couple of break-ins, you know, I think it was like something violent that happened. And so people got to the point where they were like, you know, neighborhood watch. It was important to people that they protect and look out for their neighbors. And there was that common saying, if you see something, say something, right? See something, say something. And this is one, we look out for each other. Now, I'm kind of glad that they revised it a little bit because that the guy with the Black, that was kind of creepy for me. It always made me nervous, but this is equally, I guess, creepy. But it didn't bother me as much. But the neighborhood watch program, right? And when you think about it, it the concept of it is great. The concept of it is actually very, um, you know, it's very insightful and very thoughtful, and and it makes a lot of sense because if crime starts breaking out in your neighborhood, it's only a matter of time before they get to your house, right? Or, you know, some people kind of feel like, well, you know, I'll just put my house up for sale. Problem with that is, even if they don't break into your house and the crime picks up, guess what happens? There's an impact because suddenly your house was worth 200000 after the third or fourth break-in, four blocks away. Suddenly now your house is only worth 150000 or 130000 You're thinking, what happened? I just painted this thing. I just got the roof done. I just put in the work. How is it that suddenly the value of my house is going up? And I use that analogy in talking about neighborhood watch, talking about crime, talking about property value and how it impacts us even if they don't break into your house. Because when we think about the church and we can all, you know, I, I think agree that if we were to put a value, let's say, on the church, and suddenly the church isn't quite as valuable in people's minds now as it was maybe 50 years ago, 100, couple hundred years ago. People have just kind of gotten to this place where it's like, hey, you know, church just doesn't mean that much. But what is the real source of that? What is the real reason for that? And how do you fix that? How do you fix it? Is it by starting a neighborhood watch program, so to speak, for the church? Maybe we'll get into that, but you know, I, I want to touch on this word here indifference. Because if you go back and statistically look at property values, and you look at neighborhoods that were once really prominent, really growing and thriving neighborhoods, and then they start to fall apart, they start to deteriorate. You notice that the schools start to deteriorate too, and then suddenly the grades and the uh, everything starts to drop down, but it doesn't just happen because of one or two random break-ins. It's usually because there's a difference. Instead of doing something about it, people just move out. People just walk away, or they look the other way because there's generally indifference. This, uh, I found this a little bit powerful, the Department of Indifference, and he has two men, so and what? You think about indifference, it's kind of like, man, you know, that, that's so messed up that people just don't really care. You ever felt like that when you went into a store, you went in, you know, like, I, this is always something that, like, bothers me when I go and I have to go return something like the Coles or Walmart or Target. I have to return something. And they're kind of like, eh, whatever. They're like, I'm like, I didn't even open the package. It was just the wrong thing. My wife sent me back. I got the wrong thing. And they're kind of like, ah, and they just toss it. They're thinking, man, they don't, they don't care about the product. They don't care. They're just there because they're getting their money right. They don't care. They're indifferent. They don't care. You, you ever see that? And it always makes me a little squeamish sometimes. And I'm very particular about this. When you go to a grocery store, if you ever have to return my something that's perishable or my dead, and, you, and it's like, okay, and they throw it over there. And it's like, how long has that been sitting in that car? You know, that has to stay cold, man. You can't just leave that out. When are you going to get somebody? These are the types of things where you, you realize indifference matters. You can't be indifferent about things like that. Why? Because it will get somebody sick. That's part of what we're experiencing with COVID-19. Even if you yourself are not sick, even if you don't feel bad, you can be a carrier. I was having this long conversation with my son, I'm surprised it took him this long to start like battering me with questions about it. 
But I'm explaining to him the reason why kids are not in school. Because with kids, they're typically a lot more healthy and they fight this thing off. But then they go home or they come to church or they go somewhere and they carry it to auntie or grandma or dad or mom who may have an underlying condition. So even though the kid's in school, it may not impact them in that big a way, but it can have impact by extension. So we can't be indifferent about it. So then what do we do? This is another one. Uh, because this speaks to the problem of indifference. They're in a boat. And the people on one side of the boat, they're not helping bail water. They just said, sure glad the hole isn't in our end. But when you think about how just totally like devoid of any logic that is, that's the attitude that is so prevalent in the church. Very often we can be indifferent about what's going on or we'll take the attitude of, well, I'll pray for them. But what will you actually do to engage and actually be involved? See, that sinking boat, just because the hole is on the other side doesn't mean the whole ship's not going to go down. It's eventually going to go down whether you help or not. Are you going to help? Or are you going to remain indifferent towards what's happening with your brother or sister? I want to look at Philemon. It's only one chapter. There's just a handful of verses here. I'm going to start in verse 8. It says, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold, in order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in change from the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while is that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to you, but even dear to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. So I want to set the scene here a little bit. Paul is in jail for what is it, what is thought to be about two, two and a half years or so. And while he's in jail, he is writing letters because he can't continue his journey visiting these churches. Some of them are new congregations. Some of them are a little bit older and more established. They have elders, they have leadership, they, they've gone through some things and they, um, they're growing. Others are very young and they're fighting people who are teaching false doctrine and heretics and Gnostics and people who are somehow stripping away at the deity of Christ. We'll look at that next week. But while he's writing all these letters and, and encouraging the churches and giving instructions to these other churches, he takes time 
to make sure to respond to something that he heard and something that he knew about that was very personal. You know, Paul is considered, you know, a, a, a larger than life feature, a, a larger than life person when we read through the Bible because he was so influential in what we see in the New Testament. But even with all of that responsibility that the Holy Spirit gave him to strengthen and teach and instruct about Christ and what it meant to be a follower and, and to not give up on your faith. He took this very personal time to write a letter to one guy. Somebody that he knew, someone he considered a friend, somebody who was close to him and very near and dear to him, and he responded as though Philemon was very important to him. Now, what happens here is Philemon was a slave owner. And this speaks to how slavery and human trafficking and these types of things are not something that is new. It's not something that just happens today. Currently, it, it speaks to people who do not value humanity in the way that God wants us to. And there's shades of this in what he's saying to Philemon. But the point is, he tells him about his slave here. He says, He's of no value to you because he ran away. Understand that, you know, not that it was completely different, but slavery was set up so that he could be able to be compensated for something that he was owed. Okay? It was something that he was essentially being robbed of because this slave ran away. But while this guy who owed him this time, this servitude, while he was gone, and it's considered a wash, it's a loss. I get nothing back for that. While this guy is away, he meets Paul. He, uh, he, he follows away. He becomes a disciple. He, he learns about Jesus. He gives his life to Jesus. He becomes a Christian. But Paul says, here's the thing. I owe my brother. I owe it to him that the right thing is done. But keep in mind, he's got two brothers now. He's got Philemon, and he's got, he's got Onesimus. So, you know, it's very easy to look at this, and sometimes we can get very, you know, locked in on our view where we look at it and say, well, according to the law, you know, Romans 13 tells us, you know, to obey the governing authorities and, you know, do according to the law, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. This is consistent with what we know of as Christian behavior, that we should follow the law. But on the flip side, we look at this injustice because we understand that slavery is very inhumane. It strips people of their God-given rights, frankly, and that is not respected. So you think, you know, well, how is it that I can do something that is in keeping with the law, but at the same time, something that is in keeping with the fact that we are all equal in God's eyes and we're all brothers and sisters, and that there is no better or worse, you know, because this is the same guy who's saying, hey, yeah, you know, legally, you know, there's something to be done here. And, you know, the same guy who says, you know, that we need to follow the laws of the governing authorities is the same God that says, you know, there's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no free, there's no slave. And, and it can almost look like there's a conflict. Even if you read in Colossians, if you just take the little excerpts out, you will look at that thing. well, how is it in Colossians in this letter that he wrote, which was written at the same time? He's saying, slaves obey your masters. But now he's saying to Philemon, hey, you need to treat him as a brother, not as a slave. It seems like there's a conflict there. But what we notice here, and, and what we really need to examine here, is that what Paul is actually doing is saying, hey, we, he's essentially saying, it's not my responsibility to fix, because I don't have the power to fix the laws of the land. I can't tell the Roman authorities what to do. I don't have that power. 
But as a man of God, as somebody guided by the Holy Spirit, there is something that I can do. And we're in that space right now. We're in that space right now because there, there is law and there are governing authorities that are instructing us on how we should behave. And there are people who disagree. There are lots of people who disagree. There are protests all over the country. People are mad. They're going to the Capitol. They're going to the governor's mansions. And they are mad because they want to go back to work and open back up the economy. I want to go back to work. There's a video I posted. My friend Chris was like, why do you post something like that on Sunday? Because it's Jermaine. It matters. There are people who are angry. They're like, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go back to work. And we accept the fact that there's going to be people that die. I want to go back to school. And it's not right. You know, last year, I, I uh, taught a lesson. I, I call it um, uh, Thoughts and Prayers. And, you know, we think about what was going on at the border at that time, where you had people who were being, they were running, they were fleeing something dangerous, crime and murder. And they were trying to save their children and their families, and so they're fleeing from Central America and South America, and they're coming up the border. And people are like, you know, thoughts and prayer. But it wasn't affecting them directly. And it's kind of like that boat that we looked at, where the hole is on the other side of the boat. And we're like, well, you know, I understand those people from Colombia came up here, and they came up here from Nicaragua. And it's a shame that they separated their families, but they should have just obeyed the law. They shouldn't have come here. They should have found another way. Why didn't Mexico do something? Or, you know, is it really that bad? I mean, they're getting fed and they have, you know, water available. And, and we look at it, and the best we can do sometimes is thoughts and prayers because we really, at the end of the day, just don't want to get involved. What we see here is that Paul took the attitude of, I'm not on the side of the law, and I'm not on the side of, you know, all humans and, and humanity, and if it's an unjust law, we break it. No, what he's doing is he's doing something that every Christian and every follower of Christ can do, which is he got personally involved. I can't fix the whole world, but I can deal with this situation. And every last one of us, no matter what the situation is, no matter what's going on, we can get involved. But it's what we are compelled by. What is it that drives us? Paul didn't look at this as a slave master situation. He understood it to be two brothers. Two brothers, both of which he had a relationship with. So both of which he could have influence with. He could talk to them. He could reason with them. He could show them the way of Christ. But he got involved. He got involved, and sometimes we can look at things from a macro vision and forget that it's not always a macro vision. Sometimes it's very micro, it's very targeted. Paul's appeal to Philemon was neither legal nor humanitarian exclusively. It was loving. It was out of love. He was willing to get involved out of love because he understood and he told him, he said, yeah, I know that on a, from a legal or financial or economical perspective, you've been slighted. But I need you to understand that this is your brother. Just like he told Onesimus, you need to go back as a man of God and you need to fix this with your brother. We see this example of Paul saying, I'm going to get involved. Now, here's what's interesting. We don't necessarily know what happened. There was no follow-up study done to show that Onesimus even showed up. We don't necessarily know that Philemon was like, hey, man, I hear what you're saying, Paul. Thank you. But we saw also that Paul didn't boss him around. He didn't tell him, you have to do this thing. Or you owe this to me. He said, even though you owe me your very self, he said, even though I brought you to the faith, even though I was responsible directly in bringing you to Christ, that's not my appeal. I'm not trying to leverage you. That's why I'm not telling you what to do. I'm showing you the example of Christ. 
but it was out of love for both people. Very often, if we love people enough, we have to be willing to confront it and tell them the truth. Otherwise, it's simply indifference because we don't want to be involved. This is a quote, Joan Benz. Don't know who Joan Benz is, but I've heard this many times. Indifference is the strongest force in the universe. It makes everything it touches meaningless. Love and hate don't stand a chance against it. Doesn't matter whether you're strongly against something or something is really bad or something is really good. Doesn't matter how positive or how negative something is, when you're indifferent, it's powerful. You're basically saying, it's not worth my time, it's not worth my investment, it's not worth me getting involved. Here's another one. It says, they came for me and there was no one left to speak to me. I will not be indifferent. You know, in that little quote there, it was actually the end of a much longer quote, but the full quote that that, was, that excerpt was brought out, it was talking about how, you know, you're indifferent until they come for you. So many people who are experiencing this, that's why I, I, I appreciate Jimmy and Pauline bringing up their um, neighbor and, and knowing about the winners and Dennis and sister. See, a lot of times, just like I said, that neighborhood watch program, until it comes to your house, until they break into your house, sometimes we're indifferent. We feel like, well, I bought that security system and I'm safe. You know, and I, I've got my concealed carry and I, I'm, I can protect myself and, and I do my training and I do, and we do all these things to safeguard ourselves and we forget it still has an impact on you. If you don't get involved, if you see your brother or sister struggling, if you see them in a bad place, if you see them in sin, are you reluctant to get involved because you just don't want the problem? You don't want to get dirty. You don't want to get your hands messy. What is your attitude towards your brother and your sister? Is it just I'll pray for them or I will appeal to them? that I will actually get involved. In Galatians chapter 5, starting verse 16, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, faction, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become deceived, provoking and envying each other. We see here... <clears throat> A very declarative statement. Something that we have to be reminded of. There is nothing that can stop you from what the Spirit is compelling you to do. The Spirit compels us to love, to have joy and peace. In contrast to the sinful nature, which is where all of the evil all of the negative things, all those things that corrupt our spirit, corrupt our faith. There's nothing stopping us from being guided by the spirit. The only thing that stops us is when we decide, you know what? 
I'm not going to be led by the Spirit. I'm not going to be compelled by the Spirit. I'm going to do what my sinful nature wants. And, and it's important to know, you know, all those things when they weren't, you know, going out and murdering people and hurting people. So, you know, envy is a very private thing. Selfish ambition is a very private thing. You can work with somebody for years. You can be friends with somebody. You can know somebody, have a neighbor, and they can privately be envious, have, a, have bitterness or some ill will towards you, and you, if you would never know. But the impact is still there. Our sinful nature still has an impact on people, even if, even if we keep it very private. They aren't always overt and outward in things that we can see. But we have to be willing to surrender to the Spirit. When the Spirit compels us and calls us and challenges us to go after something, to, to approach something, to be directly involved with something, do we listen to the Spirit? What we see in this example of this very small, relatively short letter that he writes to his brother and his friend, Philemon, is that he wasn't just going to take it and say, well, you know what? I heard about this thing, or I know about your slave or servant, and, and I'm just going to you know, tell you what to do. And he also didn't take the attitude of, you know what? He's a brother now. He's a Christian. He's a follower of Christ. So you just you know, need to look at him as your fellow human and not somebody that owes you anything. No. He said, this is something that you have to take up with God but I'm going to be here to work with you to do it. I'm not going to just say, well, you know what, that's between him and the Lord. So often that's the easiest thing to do. Say, well, that's just between him and God. That's none of my business. The Spirit tells us otherwise. Our ability to make change is not limited by law, but determined by love and obeying the Spirit. Our obedience to the Spirit our willingness to submit to the Spirit when it urges us, when it compels us, when it shows us clear direction on how to deal with our brothers and sisters. Churches aren't going to fall apart and disintegrate and fail because of social distancing. Coronavirus is not going to take out the church. Your brother or sister is not going to be less faithful or fall away or give up on their relationship with God. They're not going to allow sin to just overtake them because of some virus and because people have to stay home, because they lost their job. That's not the reason why. Churches are falling apart and disintegrating long before COVID-19. But it's because so many people who know who God is, who understand what Jesus did for them on the cross, their response is indifference. And instead, we have to look at the example that we see in Paul. You know, this is a question at the very beginning of the Bible when we look at the book of Genesis, where we see that we see uh, Cain and Abel, and God comes looking and he says, Where is your brother? He says, Am I my brother's keeper? We have a responsibility and a duty to our brothers and sisters, especially now. Because some people are really struggling. Yes, we're going to pray for the winners. Yes, we're going to pray for Dennis. We're going to pray for his sister. Yes, we're going to pray for Jimmy and Pauline's neighbor. Yes, we're going to pray for those who are being affected by this economically. But how else are we willing to get involved? It's easy because everybody is kind of paying attention to the coronavirus right now. But what about that couple that you know their marriage is struggling? Are you willing to get involved to help them save their marriage? To help them save their family? Are you willing to pull your friend aside and say, listen, there's an area of your life 
like we said, the acts of the sinful nature. I mean, there's an area of your life where you are struggling. You are not doing well spiritually. You are in sin. And you have to get rid of this. You have to deal with this. You can no longer ignore this. It's no different than if somebody goes out and you see them, it's like they're not social distancing, they're not washing their hands, they're touching their face, they're doing all stuff. You would look and say, look, I love you. Don't go out there and be stupid. Because I don't want you to die. You can't make them do anything. You can't control it. You can't stop it. And you certainly can't control the government. You can't control the whole church. You can't determine the actions and the behavior and responses of everyone. But you can with the brother or the sister that you are in a relationship with. Will you take the attitude of indifference? Or will you take the attitude of, I am my brother's keeper? We see that here with Paul. He wrote a lot of lofty letters and, and a lot of soaring language talking about Christ. And, and he challenged and went after and convicted the brothers and sisters in many of these churches. But this was different. All those letters he wrote, all the words he wrote were very different when he wrote this letter directly to Philemon. Because he cared enough about him. What are you saying to your brother or your sister when you don't confront them about something that God has made it plain and clear in your life and you can see it? You can hear it. It's as clear as a bell. What are you saying when you say, I'm not going to get involved? I'm not going to. You've got time. You know they're home. You know they don't have nothing to do. You can pick up the phone. You can text them. You can even write them a letter. There's a lot of things you could do right now to confront or address or encourage your brother or sister who might be struggling. Are you going to do it? Because no matter what your bend or slant or takeaway is, and, and there's plenty of time. We can go back to the subject of human trafficking and slavery and look at the details behind Onesimus and Philemon's relationship. There, there's been plenty of studies on that. There's been plenty of dissecting this topic in this very short letter that Paul wrote. But what is so germane to us today when we think about the church and what the church is dealing with, part of that new normal that I've been talking about, the new normal has to be not just having relationships with our brothers and sisters, but the new normal has to be a willingness to be like Paul and say, I'm going to confront this thing in my brother or my sister. If I have issues, if I have conflict, if I've got certain reservations or bitterness, or I've got some resentment, I'm going to confront that thing. I'm not going to let it slide. I'm not going to let it just go on. Because that level of indifference is the difference between us looking like and resembling the church and us just being the church of name only. How different are we going to be on an individual and personal level when it comes to our relationships and our willingness to love people enough to get involved? A few questions I want to uh, leave us with here. Do I avoid conflict and difficult issues under the guise of being peaceful? Does my view of personal involvement reflect Christ? Does the way that I, does my attitude towards getting involved in situations reflect the same attitude that we see with Christ? Christ was willing to get dirty. Christ was, he was willing to confront people when they were wrong. He was willing to help people. He was willing to engage. He was willing to go out of his way. He was willing to take criticism. He was willing to go to the cross and die. Do we take up our cross in that way? Does the way that we involve ourselves in our relations with one another, are we conflict avoiders under the guise, under the 
the name of being peaceful? Or are we willing to confront and deal with our brothers and sisters out of the world? Second one. In what area or areas of my life have I largely been indifferent because it does not affect me directly? Or I'll put there in the uh, brackets, appear to affect me directly. In what way have I been unwilling to step out of my indifference because I look at something and think, well, that doesn't really involve me. Well, I don't really have any say in that. You know, look at Paul, for example. Paul, you know, he could have very easily said, well, you know what? I'm just traveling from church to church, and I don't really have anything to do with that. I don't own any slaves. It's really not my concern. It doesn't really bother me. We see that in society, and we're like, well, that, that's, you know, that's, that's something that the Republicans or the Democrats are dealing with. That's something going on in the South. That's not really happening with us here on the East Coast, or that's going on in Africa or somewhere over in Asia. That doesn't really affect me. I can't change it. And we take that attitude of indifference instead of having a heart that says, I have enough compassion. I love like Christ loved. So I am going to address it. Well, that's their family. That's their marriage. Well, that's their sex life. Well, that's their money. And so we take the attitude of that doesn't affect me, that doesn't bother me, and so I'm indifferent to it, not realizing that because they are in our community, because they are in our family, because they are believers, they are brothers and sisters, I am going to, as much as I can, be willing to get involved with them. How does indifference Again, reflect Christ, but in this case, does my attitude towards indifference take shape and take form because it doesn't appear to affect me directly? What is the disparate impact of my inaction as a Christian? Do I have a conviction that my involvement as an individual matters? How can others see God through my show of love and support? Disparate impact. For those who don't know, it's a term, it, it's a uh, legal term. It talks about how different types of discrimination or prejudices, how they have a disparate impact on one group or another. How there are certain things that affect some group and other groups largely are not directly impacted. And because of that insulation, you know, I was thinking about how it would be so selfish. I was, again, I was telling you how my son was asking me questions about why everybody was home from school and how everybody gets sick and why can't he go to church? Why can't he, you know, go back to class because he's not sick and he's not carrying it? And I was explaining to him how disparate impact works pointing out to him that the reason why it's largely not impacting him isn't because he can't get sick. It's not because, you know, me and his mom can't get sick, his mom did get sick. But part of the reason why it's not affecting him is because, guess what, son? We have money. There are a lot of people that have money. So they can afford better food, which means they can afford to be healthier, which means that they can also afford to live in a house which allows them to socially distance more effectively than those who live in crowded urban areas or live in apartment complexes. When you have means, then you can be indifferent towards how they impact other people. You know, they were talking about on the news a lot about how the, if you look at the uh, ratios of people who are being impacted. And everybody's talking about, well, you know, it's like three to one, the amount of black people who are being affected by this virus. And everybody's looking at it and thinking, well, it has to be poverty. Well, yeah, it's poverty, but it's more than that. It, it, it's largely due to the fact that many of them live in food deserts, meaning they don't have fresh food and grocery stores available to them. They can't just go down to the whole food, and even if they could, can they really afford it? And then you think about not only that, the water supply. You think about pollution. You know, there, there's a difference between living in some really clean area where, you know, the nearest factory or 
something that's like 40, 50 miles away, and living somewhere where every day you walk outside, you're waiting for the bus or the train, and you can see that big smokestack. You know, the water is polluted. You know, years gone by, people were really focused on Flint, Michigan, not realizing that they still haven't gotten some of those pipes fixed. There's still lead pipes in Flint. See, these things matter. But so often, they don't matter until it affects us directly. At what point as Christians, and our inaction as Christians, again, not being activists, this isn't a call to go out and be an activist and run out and do something. Because, you know, and I've told you many times, I drive the abortion clinic right down the street, and I drive by a plane parents all the time, and I see people outside, and they have their picket signs, and they're telling everybody, you know, life is life, that kind of thing. And that's great. The question is, do you know somebody in that position and what are you willing to do directly with people who are in your life? Or because it doesn't affect you, you just think, oh, okay, thoughts and prayers. I hope it works out. And then you keep on going. At what point do we take the attitude that I'm going to get involved? That my involvement on a very personal level with people that I know about. And finally, what can I do today that will have a direct impact on the faith of another person simply by not looking the other way? Paul very easily could have gone on his way. He could have just told him this, but you know what? You need to go back and work it out. You guys both love God and we both know who Christ is and he died for you. And your brothers, so you need to go work it out. He could have said it one way. He could have very easily said, you know what, I know Philemon, I know he's probably going to be mad when Onesimus when shows back up. And I'm just, you know, tell him, hey man, you need to forgive. You need to have a big heart. No. He appealed to him directly. He got involved in a situation directly beyond writing letters to the church in Philippi. I would say it. And, and these different letters that he wrote to have influence in the church. It wasn't just some big thing. It wasn't just, I'm a larger than life person and I have influence and I got important stuff to do. He said, no, my brother Philemon matters. My brother Onesimus matters. Does your brother or your sister matter to you enough that you're willing to get involved? And your involvement, how will that impact somebody's faith? Who can you, as soon as we're done here, you, you leave out here or you log off, you get dressed right here. And like, who can you impact today? Because guess what? I know you've got your son or your daughter's phone number. You've got your brother or your sister's phone number. You've got your mom or your dad, your neighbor, your coworker, a previous coworker. A long lost friend, somebody you haven't talked about, somebody who's no longer in the fellowship, you have their phone number. You know how to reach out to them. You know how to find them. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to impact someone's faith by simply getting rid of indifference and saying, I'm going to get involved? We're going to close here with our, our final song. Before dismiss, song number 798, Yield Not to Temptation. Yield Not to
sure to get those to Jimmy by Friday so that we can have those close to the bulletin. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close the prayer. If you bow to please. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for giving us your love, for showing us your love by giving us your son. We ask that you help us to be able to uh, really show how much we love you back. Show our love to this world and especially to our brothers and sisters by being willing, especially during this time, to really take the time to get involved in each other's lives, to not be indifferent, to not take a attitude of it doesn't involve me or it doesn't concern me or that's a private or personal matter, but that even though it may be something that we don't know all the details, even if it is something that maybe we're not certain of God, that we will allow the Spirit to move us and guide us, that we will allow your Spirit to overwhelm us and take us and move us in the direction of being involved, to rid ourselves of indifference, but take the attitude that says, I love my brother or my sister. I love my family enough. I love my friends enough to take the same approach as Paul to say, I'm going to get involved because I want my brother and my sister to see God clearly. I want them to ultimately have a life that ends with eternity with you. That we help our brothers and sisters, that we encourage them, that we lift them up, not only in prayer, but indeed in what we do to really help strengthen their faith that during this time of distance, 
during this time where we cannot be as involved and engaged with one another, that we will seek you out, that we will seek your instruction, that we will get help, that we will do whatever we can to not take the attitude that it doesn't involve me, but understanding that your church will grow. People will know you because of our willingness to get involved. We thank you for the examples that we see in the Word. We ask that you continue to help us grow in this way so that others may know who you are and that your name will be glorified. See your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.